Welcome to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. With me today is Jabron Washington, CEO of Ethos Cannabis. Thank you very much for joining me today, Jabron. Before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. If you want to email the podcast, you could reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You could also subscribe to our daily newsletter. Make sure you get it delivered to your inbox first. Jabron, I always like to start with a little bit of background. How was it that you got your start in the cannabis industry? Yeah, so I mean, there's there's two there's two answers to that question, right? You have the formal one, um, you know, when you formally came into the cannabis industry, and that was about two years ago. Um, I've been part of the formal cannabis industry, um, but I've been a part of the gray market or black market um, cannabis world. Um, I started smoking cannabis when I was ten years old, um, so you know, I've been around cannabis for a long time. Um, I had family members that unfortunately had transitioned now um, in life who were. Uh, ahead of their time in cannabis um, and lost their, lost their lives in, in the war on drugs and, and things of that nature. So cannabis has always been in the peripheral um, and a part of my life uh, since I was very young. And my father had cancer and he cured, not cured himself. He used RSO to help with um, his cancer and, and went into relapse and came back again and used RSO as well. So cannabis has been a part of my world from medical and a recreational um, standpoint since early on in my life. So it's, it's been around for a while, but officially working in cannabis and getting paid for it um, that I can tell the IRS um, two years. What was it like? When did you decide to make that transition from the legacy market into the regulated market? Well, uh, I guess, you know, I mean, it's, as I got older, um, I felt the legacy calling or or maybe some of the legacy connections probably weren't beneficial for what I was trying to do in my career path in corporate America. Um, but, you know, I was constantly the guy who left happy hour early because I needed to go get high and come back in. Um, so, you know, in terms of the the legacy market, when did I leave it? Um, as, a, as a business person in the legacy market, I left that years ago. Um, as a consumer of the legacy market, never really left. Okay. Um, what is Ethos Cannabis? Ethos Cannabis is a multi-state, um, cannabis company who is centered around medical research um, in the cannabis space. We were the first in the country to have a medical partnership with a accredited medical institution at Thomas Jefferson Hospital. Um, so we were doing a lot of research with them, and that was kind of the foundation at which we were built on. Um, our business statement is making cannabis an appropriate place in society, and that really is the underpinning of everything we try to do. Uh, we really want to put the medical efficacy aspect of cannabis in the forefront, and obviously understanding that even recreational markets, a lot of times the reasons why people are using it recreationally do have some additional value as well. So we believe in the research of this plan and, and the wonderful things that it does. Um, that is going to be our differentiator. Instead of putting out a bunch of quantity of cannabis, we want about quality cannabis that's kind of made with the cause in mind. When you were transitioning from, let's say, traditional corporate America into the cannabis industry, did you have any hiccups along the way? I mean, I think in, in every industry, they have the nuances. So I think there are some 30 things that, you know, were were strange to me when I came into cannabis. Um, the overregulation was was hard to get adjusted to. Um, the driving factors in the retail spaces is different um, than in traditional retail, um, where people are less, what I would say, concerned on the quality of the product and more about the price of the product, um, which is different than where you see traditional retail spaces where you can clearly delineate between value brands and premium brands and that value proposition is understood and accepted. Um, but then there were others that are transferable. I came from the food and beverage world and uh, the similarities are, are amazing. When you think about a bar atmosphere and a bud tender, um, you know, it's a lot of that same dialogue, all of that same interaction um, that you're looking for experience wise when you come into a, a cannabis dispensary. Um, so there were some learnings, but there were a lot of transferable aspects that, that related very well to the food and beverage industry as I came into this more traditional, uh, quote unquote, retail space, meaning that we're not making things to order, uh, more things off the shelf. Do you see cannabis eventually becoming more like the food and beverage industry? When it comes to in, a, in like a, a regulatory perspective. 
FDA you're saying in terms of having the FDA or, or yeah. USDA kind of regulate? Yeah. I, I think that at a certain point they will have uh, some similarities. I think it's going to be difficult um, because cannabis is not like alcohol. It's not like tobacco, um, you know, and, and obviously it's not like food either. Um, so, you know, I think the, the transition, if we go under that umbrella, um, it needs to have some people who are specifically experts in agriculture, um, where a lot of traditional restaurants are getting, you know, agricultural audits. Um, and understanding what that transition looks like. It's two separate um, entities. So what entity will it all fall under? I, I'd be interested to see. Um, I think something that oversees alcohol and tobacco is is obviously advantageous to a certain degree. Um, but I also don't believe you should blend cannabis in 7-Elevens. Um, I think this needs to stay in you know dispensaries where you're getting very detailed information about what products you're actually putting into your body because there's so much still to learn about cannabis. I read that it was important to you that your work makes a difference. So is what you're doing making a difference, making an impact? I, I think on a, on a lot of different levels, I, I hope that it does. Um, I think from I'm an internal leadership level, the way that we, we operate, we run the business is very inclusive and um, it gives a lot of people opportunities to speak up and have opportunities to grow outside of their comfort zones. And that's kind of the way I built my career was giving people the reason why um, they should do something, but also giving them the opportunity um, to fail if their idea doesn't work. And I think that has been beneficial, I think, internally. Um, I think externally, I think people look at us as an organization that is um, really into patient care, uh, really into the informational aspect of, you know, what cannabis can do um, and how, how they can help apply that to their daily lifestyle. So I think, you know, making a difference in that aspect and showing people that cannabis can be, um, a positive drug or a positive substance. I think it's working on that regard. Um, and then I also think that, you know, making an impact, being a, an African-American CEO in an industry that was disproportionately um, harmed by the war on drugs, so that uh, it does show hopefully people that look like me the opportunity that, you know, we can grow in this space and in a space traditionally that we were villainized for, um, we can now thrive in. So I think hopefully all three of those different aspects, hopefully, um, we're making an impact as an organization and as an individual. Hopefully, uh, I can be a, a light um, or a trailblazer in some regard for some people who don't feel like sitting in this chair in this industry or any industry is possible. <laughs> On that topic, uh, you know, I know, understand that DEI initiatives have become hi uh, highly politicized. But to you, can you speak to the importance of DEI initiatives to yourself and your business? Yeah, I think I can speak to inclusion initiatives. I think, you know, DEI with the negative connotation that comes with it, I don't like to use the word too often. I think in its principle, it came out with the, the right thought process in mind. I don't think there was enough structure around how to execute, how to implement it um, in today's society. Um, so at Ethos, we believe in inclusion. We believe in equality regardless of where it comes from, um, man, woman, young or old. Um, we believe uh, they or them. Um, we believe that everyone has an opportunity to be their true self. Um, here at the organization. And, and if that needs to be labeled as a DEI initiative, then so be. Um, but we don't believe that DEI defines um, being a good person. Uh, we don't believe DEI defines, um, you know, loving that neighbor um, and treating, you know, everyone with the right just, um, regardless of their background. So, you know, get rid of the term. Um, our philosophical approach um, is to live life um, and, and work in a way that's uh, gracious, humble, um, and gives everyone um, a, a place where they can be their truest self. Um, so if there's a word that you have to attach to it or a phrase, and if it's DEI, then so be it. But um, I don't traditionally use that. And that sounds strange from African-American or minority, but um, I think we need to approach this differently um, in terms of how we're delivering this inclusion message because DEI sometimes alienated, unfortunately, um, white men in America. Um, so how do we create a different conversation that brings everyone to the table so we can make lasting and impactful change? It's kind of, sometimes it's crazy to me how we need to try to find a way to define just being a good natured person on a day-to-day -day basis. That's it. You know, and, and I am a, a nerd at heart, somewhat of a scholar, some would say, but, you know, you look at geopolitics, you look at world politics and, you know, you help me understand why the Ukraine and Russians don't like each other. Uh, they look the same. 
um, help you understand why the war in Rwanda happened. They all look the same. So I think to your point, if, if you just become a good person, regardless of the physical makeup externally that you look like, that shouldn't matter much to anyone anyways. Um, because even if you are looking like the person across from you, society has shown us, history has shown us, we'll still find a way to not like each other. Uh, so let's not worry about the external. Let's just, like you said, be a good person. Um, how can we do that? Um, irregardless of race, creed, gender, um, you can get personal, be a human being. Um, do unto others that you wish them to do unto you. As, as trivial as that may sound or as religious as that may sound, it's simple um, that we try to live by over here in ethos without the religious aspect, but just the, the, the simple aspect of the value set of do unto others that you wish them to do unto you. No, I completely, uh, completely agree. Um, so how does ethos, <clears throat> how does ethos create opportunities for former or current black market participants? That is something that we've been really trying to figure out how we bridge that gap. Um, we've been looking at how to help um, accessory um, people, you know, some very prominent people who make a lot of glass blowing and things of that nature, traditional black market, how to bring them into our stores and showcase them in different ways. Um, we have been now lurking and searching now for what we call basement cultivators um, and buying genetics from them um, to be able to bring them into the light of day. I think that you know, when you look at our portfolio, we don't buy from any large uh, breeders. Um, they're all people who are small. Um, when I say small, we're talking about no more than 30 or 40 plants, uh, most of them. Um, so the genetics that we're now coming out with in the latter part of this year and going into next year, are, I think going to be cutting edge. Uh, I think that's one way we help the black market kind of come into the light is show them a pathway um, where they can, you know, not all of them um, want to, want to, want to, want to, tax form at the end of the year. A lot of them still like to be paid in cash, <clears throat> but it's giving them the opportunity to be able to, to come into this space and then allow uh, the flower that they've expressed to its fullest to be in a retail, uh, recreational, or medical market. I think is, is a great opportunity for them. Um, and then when you look at down the line, how we normalize them in and bring them in as growers and genetics, um, you'll start seeing that on all of our, on all of our uh, jars um, is we put our breeder genetics on them as long as they were okay with letting people know that they're the breeder. Um, we were putting their names on the jars. Uh, so people understand that, you know, they passed through our hands, um, but there was someone else locally usually, or someone else as a small business owner um, that truly put their, their stamp on, on this genetic. Is that stamp a point of pride for the cultivators or are they still a little leery in terms of putting their name out there? I think it's a combination of both. Um, you know, I think there are some that is a point of pride and, you know, they're, uh, they could be West Coast oriented. So it's a lot more, it's a lot less stress in terms of putting your name out there um, because it's, it's fine. It's out in the open. Um, and then others, yeah, to your point, they don't want to necessarily be out there, but they, we still do pay owed to them by doing business with them um, and, and allowing their, their businesses to thrive in, in whatever way that we can help because the legacy market um, is what got us to where we are today. We can't ever forget that. And we think we're a craft MSO anyways. Um, so we're always going to do things that are going to be a little bit different than the uh, than what I saw with the traditional MSOs. Um, we are <clears throat> in equality over quantity, and, and we'll do things that may sometimes cost a little bit more um, because we believe in the culture of cannabis um, and what that will mean long term, um, not necessarily in the short term. How do you find these basement cultivators? We've luckily have a lot of legacy uh, employees. Um, our lead cultivator is a legacy guy, and I think that's a uh, someone that you all definitely should have on as I know that's a lot of you all specialty and um, in the cultivation space. He's, he's brilliant genius. Um, and he is a legacy openly spoken grower. Um, very successful, let's just say, and, and has had his brush fair shares of brush with regulatory authorities over the years, um, as well as many consultants all around the world. Um, helping people stand up grow. So, you know, we have someone luckily who has the, the network, um, for us to be able to, to dial into and, and through his network, um, the, they don't choose like MSOs. So, you know, we're able to also go friend to friend. Um, and that's been great for us where a lot of these smaller operators or smaller uh, uh, genetic uh, makers are not really MSO friendly. Um, so we've been lucky enough to be able to get some, some very interesting strains um, that I don't think most MSOs would be able to get. No, we would certainly welcome your lead cultivator on as well. Um, so please extend that offer, but oh, he'll nerd out about it. He'll love it. <laughs> when, so when you're working, do you have difficulty working with these basement cultivators? Like, is there a learning curve in terms of like, okay, 
this is how we got to do things in order for us to be able to sell it in the regulated market? Um, not necessarily. I mean, you know, you have different windows in each state where you can bring in clones. Um, you know, where they open, they let you bring them in. Um, there's not a lot of questions about where they come from. Um, you just have to claim them as they come into the state. So there's not a lot of uh, what I would call roadblocks there um, as it pertains to something like that. Uh, we said most of any of our genetics we have from basement um, cultivators or basement growers um, to our tissue culture lab in Massachusetts to make sure we have clean genetics when they come into the facility. Um, but outside of that, I mean, there really is not a lot of barriers um, for people not working with uh, some of these smaller uh, cultivators. There's no, there's no reason why they shouldn't be. Is there a switch that happens when, you know, at first some of these cultivators are fearful of working with an MSO and then, you know, as a result of the friendship, they get a little bit more comfortable and, you know, do they kind of like how things are on the other side? Yeah, I think, you know, there's there's a natural uh, hesitation um, that I think all of these groups are going to have. I mean, they've heard of all the horror stories of what the MSOs have done and not done, or, you know, the Walmarts of weed and you know, I think those who are, are true enthusiasts of, of the plant, um, they are cautious of, of working with MSOs and, and having us water down or uh, radiate their, their their product after it comes out just so it can pass testing instead of growing it the right way and taking the time it takes. So once they feel as though, you know, we have a good uh, cannabis head on our shoulders, I guess you would say, and we have a good rapport um, with those individuals, I think, you know, cannabis is a substance that brings people together. Um, and I think anyone in this industry is looking for people that are that same elk, the same mindset. So as soon as we can show them that we are um, one of those organizations who believe in the plant, um, not necessarily that we believe in profit, obviously, but the plant comes first. And we believe the plant can fully express itself in so many ways. Um, so once they understand that we're on that same mission that they are, it traditionally goes very smooth after that. Do you try to stay away from using the term MSO? I, I try to stay away from not including in the fact that we are a craft MSO. Um, I think it has its advantages and disadvantages um, when you are in different conversations with different people. Um, I think that there is an opportunity um, for MSOs to change the narrative around partnerships and different markets they're in to help stand the industry up. Um, and I think that will help. And that's a narrative we're trying to help create is, is what kind of partnerships can we help to, to not take over someone to help build out the cannabis culture because we do not uh want the nation to look like florida um where you don't have small operators um who aren't able to really put the the chef's kiss um as you may on the product um the way that some of these smaller cultivators can um i think we all will agree that you know once you get to fifty thousand plus square feet canopies it's hard to control quality um you can definitely move quantity but you know ten to 15,000 square foot canopy, that's still going to be the best weed in America. Um, there's no way around it. You know, they're hand watering the plants, they're getting to that aspect. So we think that we can help be a bridge or a segue into what MSO can mean. Um, and, you know, how we can do that with our privilege of being as large as we are, as we're small MSO or mid market MSO, but we're a large player in the cannabis industry. Um, you know, how can we help bridge this gap? Because we don't believe it should be Walmart's. Uh, of cannabis. We do believe in, you know, similar where the food and beverage industry is gone. Um, local restaurants, um, local uh, business oper operators who are from your community growing your products and, you know, you're giving back to your communities that you actually are, are living in. Um, we do believe that's going to be the future of cannabis. That's the, we hope is going to be the future of cannabis um, as you move this ball forward. So in your opinion, what is the best weed in America? I mean, the best weed in America is still going to be found in somebody's basement. I mean, that's that is what it is, and they're not going to be, um, they're not going to have to adhere to the, the strict testing uh, methodology that we have to adhere to in cannabis. Um, all the other regulatory aspects that, that come with that. Um, but you know, I mean, West Coast still is the best climate. Northern California is the best climate for it. I mean, you have the elevation, you have the lack of humidity, um, and you have the wonderful sunshine. There's nothing out there that can beat, um, you know, God's sunlight. So, I mean, it's, it's, those are always going to be the factors. But I think that, you know, they're always going to play against you. Um, they also have different testing methodologies if you think about the the, the legal market um, in cannabis from the East Coast to the West Coast. So there's so many factors at play there. Um, so if we had 100,000 um, CFUs in, on the east, Eastern Seaboard like they do on the West Coast, um, I would say we can give them the run for their money. Um, but, you know, they're able to grow for, you know, 10, 12, 16 weeks out there because they have 100,000 CFU thresholds. 
Um, they don't test for some of the same things they test on the Eastern Seaboard for. So uh, apples to apples, um, we can't really say that. But in terms of climate, um, California, Washington, Oregon, the climate is just going to always win out. Um, Massachusetts, Northern Mass, Maine has some great products as well. I mean, that's why traditionally they've always been legacy markets. Um, Northern New York is, is obviously with the elevation has been has been good as well. So um, I won't give the West Coast their trophy. Um, and so we're all on the same playing field. But I think that, you know, with the way genetics are coming back and forth, um, I can't say that any one person or any one region um, has the, the best cannabis. I think of this as like a fine dining restaurant. Um, you move the chef out of that restaurant, it's not as good. Um, so if you take some of these breeders and uh, you take them across the country and they're growing it themselves, then yeah, let's do it. But can you scale that up? I mean, cookies have seen how hard that is, right? Um, you know, it's not as easy as just having the genetics. Uh, I can give you the recipe, doesn't mean you can recreate. With a focus on patient care, how does that impact your cultivation methodology? Well, I think it. Uh, we 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 were making products. We do pain, sleep, anxiety studies. We're doing some uh, opioid studies here coming up next. And you know where we try to to gear our product lines is. You know we are looking for different amount of cannabinoids other people may not be looking in on, especially for some of our studies. Um, so you know we're looking for CBN high CBN strains, and we can possibly find them. We found some great THCV strains um, that that we started to find things of that nature. But then after we cultivate. Um, and we bring it down, and a lot of this, uh, for the medicinal uh, purposes, a lot of it doesn't, they don't want to smoke it. Um, so we're usually processing it through a different format. Um, so we're always thinking through, you know, what is the end use um, for this product line that we're coming out with, whether it's ratio vapes, ratio gummies, um, or whether it's straight CBD gummies. So we constantly think about the end in mind as we're going through the process. Um, but unfortunately, in cannabis, having truly CBD dominant strains is an advantageous at a current junction. Um, so we traditionally are doing that more on the, the processing side, but we do try to lean in on, onto more of the THCV things, a little easier for us to find THCV, a little easier for us to find CBGA and, and CBN and some of these strains we kind of lean into. And then we take those and we make vapes or processed products with the end, understanding what we're trying to accomplish. Is a lot of this R&D that you're talking about, is this in partnership with the Thomas Jefferson University? It is. It's in partnership in terms of they give us the idea in terms of what are the studies they want to go down and, and where do you think there's efficacy for cannabis to be proven? Um, and then on the back end with our team, um, you know, Steve Garner, the guy you're going to meet, hopefully here sooner than later, our cultivator and, and Pastor LaRose, they're popping seeds and going through different iterations of, of how to do it. Um, if not, you know, trying to find clones we already have um, that possibly can meet some of the profiles of, of what they're trying to accomplish in this study. Um, and then after that, once we get the, the, the biomass to the way we want it to go, and then obviously through the processing aspect, we're constantly consulting with them about what ratios, what do they think is going to be better, what do they like to see, um, what form factor they would like to see the product in, what they think would be um, easily, more, more easily consumable than others. Um, so, yeah, there's a definite partnership. Um, Brooke Worcester is technically um, on our payroll as well, or at the hospital and as well as Ethos. So she constantly is around. She's constantly working with us um, as she leads her team. So, you know, we're we're attached to the hip, um, you know, and it's been a wonderful relationship that we've been able to have for the last several years. How did that partnership come together? Wow, you know, I wish I had the, the exact details, and, and I don't want to give you the exact details because I'll, I'll make someone upset, but uh, we do have a, a, a longstanding uh, partnership and connection with Thomas Jefferson University with some of our um, initial investors. Um, and um, I'm assuming that is where the initial conversation started. Um, and then our our founder and, and um, our former CEO is not sure of our board, David Clapper. Um, he was consistently on the mission to really understand the medical efficacy of the plant. Um, as he was getting to learn more about the plant, he was kind of uh, not fully exposed to the plant throughout his life. Um, so as he got into the industry, he really saw the medical efficacy aspect. And he was one of the main reasons that we led the charge um, towards going towards the medical research aspect in the state of Pennsylvania. Given your experience, would you encourage other operators to seek out partnerships and opportunities in academia? Yeah. I mean, I think we, we all owe it to the consumer to really understand what we're giving them, um, really understand the efficacy of what it is. I think um, anyone that tells you that the highest THC is the best cannabis has understand cannabis. Um, so I think, you know, if if we are doing a disservice to the plant by running high 
you know, high 30s, low 40 THCs, and we're losing out, losing out all the other minor cannabinoids. I think that's a conversation that if you talk to some people in academia, they would tell you that's probably not the best idea, long term or short term for this plant. Um, you know, they'll tell you that in the studies they've seen, you know, a 19, 20 percenter um, with 3 percent terps and a bunch of other minor cannabinoids in there will get you just as high as something at 38 percent. Um, so I think that more MSOs would benefit for taking a more medicinal approach, a more medical approach. Um, and I think it would be overall good for the industry um, because it would stop this race to the highest THC and, and not allow um, and allow for quality really to come out to, to the fruition. I think that's what every MSO or every big player probably wants is, is for that exactly to happen, is quality um, to play out. But, you know, I, I always think about uh, my drinking days in college and I never – thought that the 110 proof was going to not hurt me the next day. Um, you know, so, I mean, I understand why in cannabis, we believe that the higher the TAC, the better. Um, you know, so we got to re-educate, I think, ourselves in this industry first. Um, that way we can re-educate the consumers um, so they can now get products that they really want. I mean, think about if you had anxiety um, and you go into a dispensary and they tell you to take a 35% TAC, you're going to hate cannabis because it's going to heighten your anxiety to the roof. You need to go somewhere. It's going to tell you like, eh. so how about this CBD strain? Um, that's high in CBD, low in THC, and it's going to sell because we know that's what you actually need versus people like us in the industry don't want to grow that plant because it costs just as much as the one with 35% and no one's going to buy this. So, you know, I think there's that opportunity as an industry that we're missing out on um, that I think that if we slow down a little bit and talk to some people in academia who are seeing the medical efficacy of this plant, I think we'd be surprised at, you know, where this market would actually go um, if we slowed down and did the research. So comparing it to other markets earlier, you said that cannabis really doesn't have that like quality versus value, like because people are more into quality in cannabis. Is it more of an issue with quality versus high potency right now? Yeah, I think that's maybe I should get changed what I said earlier. That's that's exactly what I mean is, you know, I don't think quality and high potency are the same thing. Um, you know, I just don't think that's a, that's a factual statement. Um, I think the DEA a couple of weeks ago, um, took a bunch of cannabis off the street and they were saying the last six months, all the cannabis they tested that's street value, um, I mean, street product rather with a 16%, um, THC, you know, and, you know, for some reason that was fine for us to buy off the street up until a couple of years ago. Um, and now if it's not 35 or more, oh, I don't get it. It doesn't work for me. It's just like, I come on, man. Um, you know, this isn't a, this isn't going to replace your opioids, um, but it does replace a lot of the other uh, big form of medications you possibly can take. And that, I think, is is where we lean into is, is how can we get there? Um, let's not try to get people drunk like alcohol. That's not what cannabis is. It's not a party drug. Um, it's not a, it's, it's really not much of a social drug. It's usually like a personal thing. Uh, there's not a lot of people that, uh, you know, get high, go get turned up. Uh, you know, they kind of get high and they chill out. Um, so, you know, I think that's if that's what we're looking for. Then then we don't need 38, 39 percent because you also probably don't want to fall asleep. Um, you kind of want to enjoy it. You want to enjoy the day. You want to enjoy what you're trying to do. You're trying to be functional um, while taking the edge off. So saying that it's not as social as, say, alcohol, do you see a future where cannabis lounges and similar establishments are more popular? Or do you think that's going to be more of a niche business? I think it's going to be more of a niche business. I think uh, I think it's going to grow um, exponentially over the next several years. I think there's a need for it. Um, you know, I would be one of those people who can consume cannabis in public and not feel paranoid and feel very sociable. Um, but I know a lot of people aren't that way when they consume cannabis. Um, you know, it's usually something else. Um, I, I, don't know, I hate to say it, but cannabis is kind of a downer. Um, it's not traditionally an upper unless you have a bunch of THCV or something like that in it. Um, so, you know, I know sativa is traditionally not going to give you a little boost of energy and things of that nature, but um, I don't know if it's traditionally a social drug, the way alcohol gives you energy, kind of gets you going. Um, you know, I think alcohol, you lose your inner inhibitions. Um, cannabis, it may become more pronounced. <laughs> uh, you know, you become a little more cautious um, of, of how you socialize, maybe what you say. But I think there's a, there's a room for it. Um, do I think it will become as prevalent as bars? Um, I don't know if that will ever happen. Um, and cannabis is current state. Um, if you think about thousands and thousands of years, I mean, it really was never used to kind of get the party going. Um, it was usually the bottle of wine or, or alcohol or mead or, or something of that nature to kind of get everybody up and going. Um, cannabis was there, uh, but it was usually another substance uh, accompanying with it. 
going back to the business side of things, you know, in your opinion, because you've had success, how is it possible for operators in the current state uh, to build a revenue positive cannabis business? And how can they do that, in your opinion, without 280E? Wow, that's that, that's a tough one. Um, or is it not possible? I, I think it's. <laughs> I know it's very possible because we are we're cash flow positive after taxes with interest with two eighty e. I think it's it's a lot of small decisions that equal big ones that kind of uh kind of led us all to be to where we are today. I think you know we have to be careful about overinvesting. Um, I think that's the biggest thing that we in cannabis have been faulty at is we grew so quick, so so fast, so quickly. Um, all the opportunities aren't great, but we thought that it'd be re recreational by now. Um, so I understand why a lot of operators got so big so quickly. Um, I think if you're a smaller operator um, and you're just retail, I think that's very difficult to, to try to say cash flow positive. Um, I think you need to be vertical. Um, and I would start with the smaller canopy and work your way up as you are selling enough product through both your retail and the wholesale channels, depending on what state you're in. Um, but I wouldn't go to a 25, 35,000 square foot canopy at all. Um, and if you can't sell that now, I would look at, you know, shutting down some of those rooms and kind of scaling the operation to what you can do. Um, and then once you've established um, some some good trend lines and then your sales trends, then I would look at expanding. Um, but I think as a retail operator, it's going to be very difficult in the near future with the way prices continue to go down. Um, so if you're not vertical, I think that's going to be a challenge. Um, conversely, if you're just a grower or a cultivator, um, I think you have your own headwinds as, you know, you don't have the reciprocity aspect that a lot of people in the industry are looking for in terms of you buy from me, I buy from you, um, if you're just selling to people. Um, so I think that the best advice I would give anyone getting in the industry is figure out how you can get vertical. The only problem with that is it's very expensive to be vertical, um, especially trying to do it at the same time. Um, so if you're going to go retail, I would be super focused on the purchase prices that you're buying on the retail side to try to keep your margins above 40 to 45% if possible, so you can pay your tax bills um, and then try to get that business over, you know, seven, $8 million because anything less than that is going to be tough. You said it's a, a number of small decisions. You know, in your uh, history at the head of this company, can you think of some of those small decisions you made that really made a difference in the company? Yeah, um, I think, you know, how we scaled up um, our two operations that we currently have. You know, we're not at full capacity in Massachusetts, which has been a godsend so far. At Ohio, we've uh, turned the trigger, we pulled the trigger rather of growing um, our canopy there with Ohio coming on. So that was a good decision to spend money. The other one was a good decision not to spend money. Mm -hmm. um, in Pennsylvania, we have uh, made some some cutting edge changes. And I'll let Steve kind of get into some of his, his nerdy stuff and the cultivation and production aspect that have created vast efficiencies for us. Um, so I think there's been some of those things that kind of happened along the way that we didn't realize have a big ripple effect, ripple effect, impact, uh, effect, I'm sorry, um, on the business, but it ended up having a, a pretty big one. Um, and then the negative ones that we've had, I won't share them. And we'll just say there's water on the bridge or lessons learned. Um, and we'll continue to move forward to, to try to figure out where our next failure is going to come from. We believe in a lot of failure on this side. Fail quick, fail often. Well, I like your, uh, I like how you talk about embracing organic growth because I do feel like as part of that, for lack of a better term, green rush, you know, it was kind of this spend money to make money mentality and not natural growth. Yeah, it was. I mean, I think that's, we got to understand. I mean, this wasn't a traditional financing. We're talking about PEs, uh, private equities, where they are, they're, they're, they're trying to maximize their investment as quickly as possible. Uh, they're not using it for long-term holds. Uh, they're three, five, sevens. Um, so, you know, when you're thinking about people with that investment mentality, then, you know, go big, go fast, go go shallow, um, not deep. And then that makes sense to them because they were trying to flip it um, as, you know, hopefully 280E came down or descheduling happened. Um, you know, they thought it was going to happen a couple of years ago. Uh, they were hoping that it was going to happen a couple of years ago. So from an investment standpoint, it made a lot of sense, total sense. Um, I think we've all kind of been kicked in the teeth a little bit. Um, and we now understand we may have to hold on to the investments a little longer. Um, they may not be worth as much as you initially thought, um, especially now the competition is coming to the marketplace. So I, I think there was, there was learnings there. Um, but I think now we, we all understand that, you know, going big doesn't mean going is better. Canada's shown us that. We've heard from a lot of operators, various types of social equity initiatives. 
Is there anything in particular that you're doing at Ethos that you're particularly proud of? Yeah, we, we do a lot of stuff with um, the communities that we serve. We do believe we, we, we are the communities that we serve. We've done a lot of stuff in the Last Prisoners Project and a lot of local organizations. Um, and that's kind of been our forefront. Now, from the social equity standpoint, in terms of social equity applicants, in terms of dispensaries and how we prop them up, we want to do a lot more of that. We have talked to a lot of the legislators, asked, uh, le legislative people about how um, we can do more with that because we would love to be able to get a tax credit for it. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity for us large organizations to help stand up some of these ones that are struggling, um, but there is no tax benefit for us. And as we're all struggling to stay cash flow positive, and most of us aren't cash flow positive, um, that becomes a, a much harder pill to swallow um, when you're throwing, you know, good money behind good money in this case, but, you know, you're not getting any credit for it. Um, so we're really looking for the local, at the state level at least, to give us some reprieve there, um, where if we do some help with some of these investments, um, that will help the, the smaller social equity aspect. And we're also working with social equitable, I mean, equitable access to cannabis, as we're learning in a lot of the minority communities, there are dispensaries. Um, we're really trying to figure out with Thomas Jefferson um, how we can create delivery services to service some of these communities to also help the consumer aspect of it as well. So I guess it was a three-pronged approach. That's how I would look at it, um, of what we're trying to accomplish. When it comes to minorities and leadership roles in cannabis, how would you describe the state of the cannabis industry when it comes to minorities leading in both management and C-suite roles? Not enough. Too too slow. Um I think, you know, when we say minorities in cannabis, I think in, in this specific um, phrase, when we talk about cannabis. I think we need to be cognizant that um, minority usually means people of color in cannabis. Um, so I don't want to conflate, you know, as, as much as women have been disenfranchised and they're not given the opportunities. Um, sometimes, you know, a white woman in cannabis is considered a minority, but that's not what I would call impacted. Um, by the war on drugs or the war on cannabis. So I think there needs to be a lot more opportunities um, in cannabis for people of color um, to be able to have the opportunity to grow um, in this industry. Um, we took a street drug or a street industry, brought it into the light of day, didn't change anything. We use all the same terminology, we use all the same strain names and the whole nine. Um, but the people that were on the corners that we threw in prisons and, and we threw at a, at a four times the one rate in our communities, um, in the prison who built this industry. Um, I believe they deserve a fair shot to work in this industry and thrive in this industry because they obviously understand inventory. They obviously understand customer base. They obviously understand the product. Um, and are those transferable skills that they have accumulated um, going to be beneficial for this industry? Yes, I think they will be beneficial. I think that there needs to be a conversation at the state levels in a lot of these states to allow people with records to be able to even work in Canada. Um, a lot of people with records aren't allowed to even work in Canada. You know, if they got arrested for selling this exact substance, um, you know, which is which is strange in itself. But I think there's a lot of different opportunities for us to to look at. I think at the hourly level, um, there's a huge opportunity for us on the retail side to look at. I think at the executive level, we need to do a better job of shepherding in individuals who understand this industry um, better. That should maybe traditionally corporate America executives understand this industry, and a lot of times they don't fit in our industry. As I'm sure you know. Um, so allowing some of these organic people to grow in the industry and give them the opportunity, um, that would be great, I think, for us to have. And I think the last thing for uh, minorities that really is concerning for me is is we're not in the cultivation side um, at all. I mean, I think in the retail side, you'll see more minorities. The C-suite, you don't see any at all, really, uh, um, or very few. Um, but on the cultivation side, it's almost none, um, especially in leadership. And I think that is probably a pathway that I think that we need to reinvest in. Um, as an industry because, you know, farmers um, traditionally were minorities. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, Caucasian people didn't have a tremendous impact on the cannabis industry and growing it and making it stay. So, but I'm saying there was a lot of people with hands in the pot. Um, and I would love to see more of them when I walk into some of these other grows um, that are a little more diverse. And we have a very diverse grows, um, but I think we can still do better, especially in our leadership levels. What are some of those pathways? What are some of those ways that we could do better to get more minorities involved in cultivation? I think, you know, we need to really reach into the, the collegiate landscape, especially a lot of these agricultural schools, um, and, and start the recruiting base there. I think showing them there's an opportunity here um, in cannabis that's very lucrative, I think is, um, is an opportunity for us to get some more minorities into this space. I think, unfortunately, when it comes to opportunities, 
Um, it's similarly to the reason why we celebrate June 10th in 1965, two years after Abraham Lincoln is, is minorities should traditionally get the newsletter. Um, so I think, you know, being a little bit forefront in that information flow would definitely help um, bring more of these people into the industry. But I also think it's going to take operators, individually operators, to create an environment where they feel welcome and they feel heard um, in those spaces. And I think, you know, Ethos and there's several others that I think are in that same vein and working towards those, those, those opportunities and those goals. But I think that's probably the best bet is to go where they are, is that these HBCUs or agricultural schools and start recruiting there and figuring out how we can get the best and brightest talent into this industry right away out of college. In terms of finding talent right now, do you struggle with the labor shortages, skills gaps, the way that some other operators do, or have you had more success there? I think on the retail side, um, we struggle a lot less. I think it's a lot easier to find people to want to work in the retail space. Um, I think that is something that is going to be prevalent. It's always cool, I think, to work in cannabis and in retail. Um, in the cultivation space, it's it's a challenge. I think, you know, we have the same individual or the same mindset that exists in the retail space. It's cool. It's fun. Um, and then all of a sudden you get in there your first day in the grow and you realize it's work. Um, you're a farmer. It's hot. It's humid. Uh, I'm going to be sweating every day. Oof, this is real. I got my hands are a little stiff after cutting and trimming all day. Um, so I think, you know, that element, um, I think across the board and across the country, I think, you know, it's always hard to find anyone that's really sweat for eight hours every day. Um, so, you know, I think it's, uh, it's going to be an uphill battle, but I think that, you know, we have been lucky, uh, a little bit more lucky than others, um, of not being severely understaffed anywhere at any of our facilities and, and being able to create a good pipeline. Um, I think that has a lot to do with our culture and the way that we treat people. I think the word has gotten out, is getting out, um, that if you're going to work in cannabis and you're in one of our three states, um, you probably are going to take a hard look at us before you look at anybody else, just because of the work-life balance and the culture that we bring, um, to this space. How do you promote a positive work-life balance? A lot of things are kind of same before. You know, I, I am a servant leader in every shape, way, or the form. Um, you know, do I have an ego? Do I have pride? Of course, I got all that stuff going. Um, but I am not too prideful to be able to listen to other people who work for me. Um, I am always going to ask a lot of questions. I, I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. So what that does is create a, a culture of inclusion. Um, we believe that, you know, help is the most powerful word in any language. Um, and, you know, as we ask our teammates for help, we believe that we help each other out um, so that no one person feels like they're on an island or the burden is that big. So it's, it's a collective type of approach towards how we lead. Um, you know, each one of my functional leaders, they also understand that they're responsible for one of their other functional leaders' responsibilities because we are intertwined as an organization. So we believe that works all the way through, all the way down to the hourly level. So what happens in return and is you have a very inclusive organization that, People have voices, people have opportunities. Um, I think last time I checked this year, um, we have had 75 individuals be promoted internally um, since January 1st. So we also practice what we preach about growing people and showing them a pathway to be here. Um, so I think for all those different reasons, again, it's not one thing that we do well. I think it's a bunch of little things that we are trying to intentionally do better um, that are hopefully going to create um, what our ultimate goal is by the end of 2026 is be the uh, workplace of choice in the Northeast, regardless of industry. That is our goal that we're going toward by 2026. So if we can create an environment in cannabis that is the best of any industry, um, we feel that, you know, that would be a good way for us to continue to be uh, a recruiting tool for us moving forward. You had mentioned struggles with overregulation, particularly when you started in the industry. Do you see rescheduling as a pathway of a better regulatory landscape or a more difficult one? I think, you know, there needs to be some federal consistency when it comes to testing. Um, I think that is something that I would love to see at a federal level where there's a consistent testing method, consistent testing methodology, similar to alcohol. You know, I mean, if, if I see 35%, 70, 70 proof, I believe it, no matter if I'm in California, if I'm in Florida, I believe it. I think that needs to be consistent. I think that um, far too often in our industry, um, test shopping happens. Um, and I don't understand. I, I didn't understand that. That didn't make any sense to me. Um, how we're getting different numbers, which, you know, again, we go back to the THC, the much of BS anyways, but, you know, we get back into that conversation of, well, this doesn't make sense. Um, I think the over-regulation and some of the aspects and some of the additional testings and things of that nature, I think if they did more research, they realized they don't need to do some of those things. So I think that would help. 
Um, and then if you're going to have a regulatory authority or a regulatory body, no matter which state you're in, um, they need to be able, either personnel-wise, um, to be equal across the board. Um, I think far too often the regulatory authorities in most of the states that we operate in, most of the states in the United States, in the U.S., um, they're reactionary. They're not proactive. Um, and they just go after what they been, were being told versus what they're actually seeing going on in the industry. And the industry tends to be several steps ahead of them by the time they catch up. Um, so if we were to go to a federal regulatory aspect, maybe that will equal the playing field. So everybody's playing by the same rules. Um, but, you know, it, it's I've never seen an industry so regulated and then selectively enforced. Have you run into any issues with testing? Um, in terms of just in terms like, of like, like uh, issues with labs or inconsistencies, anything like that, or you know, how have you ensured made sure that you know you're kind of uh, working with the best testing facilities out there that are available to your operations? Yeah, so we we try to go with ones with the best reputations. Um, you know, we don't do a bunch of test shopping or anything like that. We don't. It was necessary. If you can't make it work there, then it probably won't work anywhere else. Um, excuse me. Um, we have seen that there are some that are willing to cut corners more than the others, and that's just not people that we want to really deal with because we want to put out a safe product and regardless of THC percentage. Um, so we have found there are ups and downs with it, but I, mean, I think all in all, um, 95, 98% of all the people who are in testing, they're trying to do the right way. I don't think, I think there's just, there's so many different ways to slice an apple, right? There's so many different ways to get to the end result. Um, that allows for a lot of the fluctuation um, of like how you're breaking down that bud, how deep you're going into it, how, you know, so it's, we need a uniform approach. So I think 98% of them are trying to do the right thing. Um, I think there's probably obviously 2% bad actors or just, you know, you pay me enough, I'll give you whatever you want. Um, but I think 98% are just trying to do it the right way. Um, it's just that there are variations in how you can test for cannabis across the board. I mean, state to state, but in, even within the state, there's just, there's different ways you can do this thing. Well, Gibran, I really do appreciate you taking the time and your insight into the industry. Um, you know, before we get out of here, is there anything else that you want to make sure the Cannabis Equipment News audience either knows about yourself or Ethos Cannabis? Yeah, I think just from um, from the from the Ethos Cannabis standpoint, I think just to know that we're we're, we're we to say internally we got next. Um, you know, we have been uh, the little engine that could, and and we've been working quietly behind the scenes to develop a brand and a product line that is going to be somewhat of a disruptor in the cannabis space, but also is um, going to be something I think the, the cannabis um, community, especially in the Northeast, has been wanting for and, and needing, um, is a large player who is believing in the craft aspect of the MSO and is also cultivating products with a purpose. So you know, just look out for us as we continue to grow our brand and our footprints, whether that's on the medical side or the recreational side, um, and know that we're going to be a brand that you can trust, uh, you can consistently come back to to get quality products um, with you in mind, with the consumer in mind. Jabron, you had a uh, a background in other industries. One thing I have noticed um, is that once the cannabis industry kind of gets its professional hooks in, people are there for good. You know, for you professionally, is it uh, cannabis uh, for the foreseeable future? I'm home. Um, I, I came home. I'm, I, I feel um, I am my truest self. Um, my truest identity is finally allowed to be fulfilled. Um, being in this industry, I think it was a long time coming. Um, so yeah, I'm home. I think this is. This is where I want to be for the foreseeable future. Um, obviously, growing ethos and, and building us out into a billion dollar entity um, is the objective here. But, you know, if, as we look at the cannabis in the next 20, 30 years, I plan to be a player and, and being a part of it um, in some way, shape or, or other. I mean, what other industry is better than this one? I'll tell you what. It's truly inspiring, man. Uh, thank you very much for sharing a bit of your story. Hey, man, I appreciate it, Dave. Thanks so much for having me on, man. Look forward to talking to you again sometime. All right. Well, before we get out of here, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You can also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. If you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You can also subscribe to our daily newsletter. Make sure you get it delivered to your inbox first. All right. For Jabron Washington, CEO of Ethos Cannabis, I'm David Manti. This is the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. We'll see you next week.